Hello, my name is Kent C. Dodds and I teach people how to build excellent user experiences wherever they are. I've taught people how to build excellent user experiences on the web and now guess what? We're all moving over to AI because that's where our users are going. And so now I teach people how to build excellent user experiences with epicai.pro as my course platform. Go take a look at it. Today I want to talk with you about how user interaction is changing, how model context protocol and things like it are helping make that change possible, and what your role in this is as a product developer or as somebody who's trying to reach users where they want to be. And where they want to be is inside of AI assistance. So let's talk about that. My talk is letting AI inter interface with your app with MCPs or model context protocol services. Uh, and normally when I start my talk, I actually invite people to stand up because, or at least get their body moving because our bodies need blood to flow for our brain to operate properly. Um, this is kind of a, an awkward thing to do in a remote setting, so we're not going to do that. But if you've been just sitting around for a while, I invite you to move your body, stand up if you can, and uh, get blood flow because your brain does need that. So make sure you're taking care of your body. <laughs> All right, so let's just get right into it. I'm going to show you a video of Tony Stark interacting with his AI assistant Jarvis. So if you're not familiar with Tony Stark, he's Iron Man. And um, this is from one of the Iron Man movies. So um, as we're watching this, I want you to uh, consider what are the things that Tony is having his AI assistant Jarvis do that we are not able to do with the technology that we have right now. And then we'll talk about it once the video is done. Here we go. I've compiled a Mandarin database for you, sir. Drawn from SHIELD, FBI, and CIA intercepts. Initiating virtual crime scene reconstruction. Okay. What do we got here? Close. The heat from the blast was in excess of 3,000 degrees Celsius. Any subjects within 12.5 yards were vaporized instantly. No bomb parts found in a three mile radius of the Chinese theater. No, sir. Any military victims? Not according to public records, sir. Bring up the thermogenic signatures again, factor in 3,000 degrees. The Oracle Cloud has completed analysis. Accessing satellites and plotting the last 12 months of thermogenic occurrences now. Take away everywhere that there's been a Mandarin attack. That's two military guys. Ever been to Tennessee, Jarvis? Creating a flight plan for Tennessee. All right. Well, that's pretty cool. I would I would like to have a Jarvis like that that can help me. Can you imagine Tony doing all of that research and everything without an AI assistant? Uh, it would take longer. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So what did Jarvis do? Compiled database, generated UI on demand, access public records, brought up thermogenic signatures. <laughs> I, I think I know what that is. Uh, and Tony said, take away everywhere there's been a Mandarin attack. So uh, joins across uh, different data sets. Uh, showed related news articles, uh, created a flight plan for Tennessee, and answered the doorbell, or at least showed Tony um, the, who was at the door with like all their, you know, don't go to Tony's house if, if you want your privacy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this is really exciting, uh, exciting stuff that, to think that like we could maybe have some of this. And so the question is, can we? Like what, what did Jarvis do that we can't do? Okay, so there were actually uh, a couple of things. It's not just nothing. Uh, we probably uh, couldn't uh, uh, create a database based off of field, uh, FBI and, and CIA and uh, SHIELD database stuff, but not for technical reasons. And the holographic stuff, I think we're, we're still working out. Uh, but generating UI, we absolutely can do that. And people do that all the time. Uh, so we have the technology to do this stuff. So my question is, why don't we each have our own Jarvis already? Like, what, what's stopping us? And the, the interesting thing is, that we've actually tried this. We've been trying this forever. And it's just not, it's not quite there. And so why is it not quite there? What's, what's holding us back from being able to have Jarvis? Like, isn't that just the most amazing experience? And, and Jarvis isn't just like a, like something that you talk with, you know, you know, if you're in the office with a bunch of other, other people, you probably don't want to have a talking interface. It's also like he uses uh, typing and he also uses gestures and, and everything too. 
and he de uh, generates dynamic UIs and then he can interact with those as well. So like it's a really, really awesome user experience. So why don't we have a Jarvis, even though we've been working on it? What, what is holding these different assistants back? And the answer is integrations. It's just really, really hard to build all the integrations for all the possible things. Here are a bunch of logos for things that you might recognize, some things that you don't. Some are technical, some are like normal people things. And I want to have a robot that can interface with all of them. And like, here's the, the real kicker. I want to have a robot that interfaces with everything. And the uh, challenge of building an integration for every one of those things just means that Google is not going to build an integration for your local city's government website for reserving pavilions at the park. And I want that. I want my robot to be able to do all of those things. And if it can't do everything, then why spend the time wiring everything up together so that it can do some things? And there are some activities that we take or some activities that we do, some things that we do that don't really, um, like don't make it worth it to spend all the time wiring things up. Like we just don't do it enough. But it would be really cool if there was some standard mechanism for my AI assistant to interface with something that I've never used before and I won't ever use again. But I don't wanna have to like click around the website and figure it out. I want my LLM to figure that out. And that is what model context protocol enables for us, is a standard mechanism whereby our AI assistants can communicate with these uh, various uh, tools and services. So let's talk a little bit about the history and architecture of MCP, model context protocol, and, and just like tool calling and that sort of thing in general. So phase one, about three years ago, ChatGPT comes out. And uh, this is a really, really exciting time because it answers our questions. It can, like, we can say, like, tell it something and ask it something and it can answer the questions. And maybe the answer isn't always right because it's not intelligent, it's just generating tokens. But like lots of the times it is and it's gotten made way better. And so this is really exciting. And what made it so pivotal is the fact not, not the fact that we had an LLM. We've had LLMs for a long time. What made ChatGPT so awesome is the host application layer around the LLM, ChatGPT itself, not the LLM, but the application around it that brought a good user experience to interfacing with an LLM. And then once that happened, a lot of investment went into LLMs and they got better, better and better and better, much faster because we started to see a lot of value. The problem was that you would have to provide the context yourself. You copy paste your code and say, hey, what's wrong with this? Please refactor it, whatever. And then you'd have to copy and paste its result back into your code base. And then you find out it wasn't working for uh, some other reason. <laughs> um, but you're, there was a lot of context, like manual context, bring it in in the form of text. And then we added images, but uh, having to manually bring in that stuff and then manually take it out. And then of course you've got your context window and all that stuff. So it, it couldn't do anything. It could answer questions, but like couldn't do anything and uh, managing context ourselves was kind of a pain. So then we get into phase two where the host application is like, hey, I'm like regular code. I, I interface with this LLM. I could tell the LLM, hey, I need you to let me know if you need more context and I can go get it for you. So now we have search engines. And hey, if they want to schedule a, a time to meet with somebody, I have a, a calendar integration. And uh, oh, if you want to summarize your Slack messages or your notifications or something, I have a Slack integration, whatever. So the host application, is now enabling it to do stuff. I can tell it, hey, do this thing, and now it will do that thing. And uh, the the problem here is that you're kind of limited with the, the things that it can do, and also the sources where it can get its, um, its context. You're limited by the uh, developer's time uh, at OpenAI or Anthropic. How much time do they have to dedicate to building out these integrations? And this is really the same problem that we have with our existing assistance and the existing efforts that we've put into building integrations with all these different services. You're not going to convince OpenAI or Anthropic developers to build an integration for your city government website or anything like that. That's just not going to work. 
And granted, OpenAI has their uh, own GPT plugin system, but it's proprietary. And so it's uh, difficult, even though ChatGPT has a lot of uh, buy-in from uh, the users that you have. Um, it's difficult to justify building something special for ChatGPT and then something special for Anthropic and then something, something special for Google and whatever. Uh, it'd be much better if we had some like standard mechanism. So yes, it can do stuff. And, and for a lot of people who couldn't get buy-in from the, um, the company to build a built-in integration, they would just build a wrapper, their own host application with their own tools. And the thing is, users don't want to do that. Users want one Jarvis, just one, just one Jarvis that is able to augment itself with any capability in the world, any possible capability. They don't want to have to load up your uh, LLM wrapper with the context necessary and then grab that context and put it into the next tool and whatever. They want one thing that can interface with all of them. And so, yeah, it can do stuff, but it can't do enough. And that is a big pain. And that's what pushes us into phase three, MCP. Now, with MCP, it can do anything because MCP is a standard protocol that all of the uh, different assistants support or will very soon support and uh, now you can build to the MCP spec and you're usable by any of these AI assistants because it's a standard. So we can do anything. The clients aren't quite ready at the time of this recording just yet, but soon they will be and it's going to be phenomenal. We are just one really good user experience application away from Jarvis for everybody. And that's very exciting. So to expand out on this a little bit uh, as far as the architecture is concerned the host application is communicating with the llm and the host application tells the llm what services are available to it and those services can be dynamically added uh, they uh, can be um, added and removed so like this context can be managed by the host application and the llm just knows what's available now and the user's query and then it can select the most appropriate tool the host application uh, creates a client for every uh, service that it wants to interface with. And this client is a standard uh, client, so it doesn't need to have any special uh, integration with anything. There's a standard interface for this. And then the service provider creates the MCP servers and uh, those servers interface with tools, resources, prompts, sampling, like lots of really uh, cool features on that end of the spectrum. And this is what makes it so great is that the service provider is in control control of this stuff. This is the stuff that's going to be unique to every uh, service. Uh, everything else, like the, the server and the client, that interface, that communication is standard. And that's why this works. That's why it's so cool. This is how, uh, the way I say it is, this is how we give Jarvis hands to be able to actually do stuff. It's very exciting. So I want to show you a little demo of um, uh, a couple of MCP servers that I put together uh, to kind of explore what's possible here. Like I said, the clients aren't quite ready, so the experience is not the uh, what the Jarvis experience was, but I, I don't see any reason why we can't get there. So let's get into that. So first, um, I made this uh, in London, so it's going to find out my current location here in a second. But uh, here's the prompt. This is in, in Claude Desktop, with, which has been configured with my MCP servers, three of them. Please write a journal entry for me. So one of the MCP servers is a, a journaling uh, server. Uh, here's my email address. About my trip with my daughter, I would like you to derive my location and weather conditions from my device location and make up a creative story with relevant text. Thanks. So <clears throat> we execute this. And as part of the context, um, it uh, has an MCP server called Locationator, which will determine the current location. And so with this, I'm going to allow it for this chat. Now you notice, Tony didn't have to approve different tool calls and stuff for Jarvis because Tony has a lot of trust built up with Jarvis. We don't quite have that trust built up yet and, or that uh, capability. And so that's why we're not quite there yet. Um, and we have to approve every tool call and stuff, but we'll get there eventually once uh, things get more reliable. So here it gets my current location. That was my location at the London Hotel. So don't worry, this isn't my home. <laughs> uh, and then I check the weather. This is from another tool, uh, another server, uh, Get Weather, for getting the current weather at um, a given uh, coordinates. 
And now it's going to run another tool from Epic Me. This is the Authenticate tool because I haven't logged in yet. And so I'm going to provide my email address to the Epic Me server. And at the time of uh, this demo, um, I didn't want to actually open up my email and, uh, as part of this recording. And so um, I was just running it locally and I logged it to the uh, console. So let me just grab that token and I provide that auth token. And so now my MCP client has been authentic or it's going to be <laughs> authenticated with this validation token. So the MCP server has authentication built in. It's based on OAuth 2.1. And so it's uh, as secure as anything else that you're using OAuth with. And um, my uh, Jarvis client or, or Claude desktop has been authenticated so I can perform authenticated tasks, which uh, one of which is to create a journal entry. Now, of course, <coughs> The LLM is going to write the journal entry for me. I don't want to take the time to do that. But you could write your own journal entry, uh, of course, and uh, have it just insert that yourself. And with the right kind of interface, you could uh, speak your journal entry and it could format it nicely for you and everything. That's what makes these LLMs so cool. And especially when we're talking about multi multimodal stuff. So um, we're going to create a journal entry um, with that information. Um, my MCP server configured the inputs and things. And now it's going to check, OK, what tags do you have available? OK, great. So you've got a travel tag. Uh, let's, or let's create a travel tag because you don't have one for that. And that makes sense for this journal entry. We'll add that uh, tag to the entry. And, uh, and then like it continues uh, in this manner. And, Here's uh, another really cool and interesting thing about MCP and the fact that we're working with an LLM um, is I, I can actually ask it, hey, <clears throat> could you show me that journal entry? And remember, that journal entry, it had a title and it had contents. Um, but here, it's going to uh, retrieve that journal entry. And then it decides, based off of what it retrieves, that there's a, a good way to format that that's better than just the JSON format that is provided. So the server can communicate in a way that makes a lot of sense for the server. Um, and then the client can take that as context to display whatever it wants to the user. Right now, we don't have um, <clears throat> very many uh, clients that support any s mechanism for displaying like a dynamic UI or like a card or, or something like that. But you can imagine that we could totally do that. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. And I think it's actually also interesting that it rendered this as kind of markdown with a uh, title and everything too, uh, which I think is pretty cool. And additionally, uh, I could actually ask it to translate this into any language, and it would do a pretty good job of that too. So maybe the MCP server is uh, sending responses in English, but you're talking to your LLM in Japanese, and the LLM can convert that English response into Japanese, which I just think is very, very uh, cool and interesting. So here now I'm telling it to delete the post and log me out because it's fake. And um, again, all of the authentication stuff that you would expect uh, all works here. The Epic Me MCP server is completely only accessible via uh, MCP and uh, clients like this. You can't actually access it as a web application. And I think that is the transition that we're going to be experiencing very soon. Users don't want to use a browser. They don't want to Google and have to figure out the right way to phrase their question. When I was teaching my parents how to Google, uh, they just typed out a full on question and their results were not very good. So we had to train them. No, 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 <clears throat> you have to write it in this special format, and then you'll find, like with these keywords and stuff, and then you'll find what you're looking for. Well, now we're going back to what's more natural. Just speak your question, and the AI will be able to figure out what you're trying to accomplish. And not just what you're trying to search for, but what you're actually trying to do, and it'll actually be able to do that thing for you. That is what MCP enables, and that's why I'm so excited about it. So <clears throat> just to wrap us up, I've got a bunch of resources for you. There's the specification for model context protocol. It's very good. You should definitely take a look at that. I am very active on Epic AI. And so you can go check out epicai.pro and learn all about not just MCP, but AI in general. I've got a whole bunch of uh, posts that you can take a look at <clears throat> all about um, the, the future of user interaction and how AI is changing the game for us. It's very exciting and I hope that you join me there. I also have workshops and cohorts and things that you can go through and join me on. 
And uh, the at whatever time you're watching this, there will be uh, something to, to go and learn there. So go check out epicai.pro. With that, I just wanna say, you're great. Thank you so much for watching my talk.